Hello, everyone. My name is Rich Ottinger, and I am the Marketing Programs Manager for Park Systems. Welcome to the fourth installment of Park Systems 2020 Material Science Research and AFM webinar series. Today's presentation is on 3D printing, testing for mechanical properties. Before we begin, let me give you a quick overview of today's session. The presentation is expected to take about 40 to 45 minutes, which should allow some time for a question and answer period at the end. If you click on the raise your hand button at that time, I can unmute your line to ask a question. If you would prefer, you may type in your questions at any time during the webinar, and I will try to pose those at the end. Any of these questions that we do not get to, we will address in a follow-up email. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Dr. Advincula is a professor of macromolecular science and engineering at Case Western Reserve University and the editor-in-chief of MRS Communications. He's a fellow of the American Ch Chemical Society and is the author of more than 250 peer-reviewed publications. Please welcome Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Thank you very much, Richard, for that generous introduction. And I'd like to thank our audience uh, for being with us today. Uh, I hope and appreciate uh, your, your um, uh, viewership and also wish you well uh, in terms of your health and uh, endeavors. And I recently moved to uh, University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Lab, but I have uh, a lab and uh, a, um, a research professor position still uh, with the K School of Engineering. So today I'm going to talk about mechanical properties of polymers in general and how they apply towards 3D printed parts or development uh, of mo models as well as standards for uh, thermomechanical testing. So uh, having been uh, um, and familiar with the developments in 3D printing, the ecosystem for applications, for manufacturing, for different types of uh, inspired, bio-inspired design will only grow. And this was uh, the gist of my talk uh, at the World Economic Forum back in 2016. And today, you can, of course, buy your own 3D printer uh, from Amazon, or you can contract a local manufacturing or uh, 3D printing firm to produce products for you, as well as uh, take advantage of the number of chemistries, raw materials, and 3D printing, including hybrid methods. So here we have a summary of some of the more popular 3D printing methods, including FDM, SLA, SLS, uh, and different derivatives that can be applied towards metal and ceramic 3D printing. After all, the amount of interest and the number of materials that can be 3D printed is growing and will only be uh, uh, grow when applied to new applications, uh, including biomedical, industrials, uh, military, and other types of tooling, machining uh, of parts, etc. And what you can see here is that uh, a number of these applications will garner more complexity, higher demands for performance, different types of thermal properties, but also there is high interest on their failure mechanism. Uh, failure can be quite costly. I, I can give some examples myself in terms of, uh, well, car repair, how uh, some of this can be attributed to uh, parts that fail uh, uh, unexpectedly or were not pre uh, prepared properly. So this chart here simply shows that this ecosystem uh, will grow beyond prototyping, uh, beyond product development, but actually different aspects of the industry, supply chain, and a different interest in terms of material requirements. Uh, actually, this current pandemic situation is a good example where 3D printing answered a call in terms of uh, fabrication of PPE devices, ventilator parts, etc. So what you can see is that additive manufacturing as a process is dominated by uh, different types of methods, uh, in, including use of resins by vat polymerization, uh, SLS based on powder bed fusion, and in terms of uh, um, types of materials, I'm um, 
proud to say, of course, that polymers, uh, plastics, thermosets, or even elastomers play a big, big role in 3D printing, much more than the use of metals, uh, ceramics, and composites. Lastly, when I mentioned it's a plastics world, we know that plastics is just one of a polymer uh, uh, ecosystem. That is, a polymer is essentially a large molecule or sometimes what we call macromolecule. Polymers can be divided into thermoplastics, thermosets, uh, elastomers. Elastomers can be further divided into uh, thermoset elastomers and thermoplastic elastomers. So in other words, additive manufacturing will be synonymous to growth in the demand for uh, new and uh, strong or high performance polymer materials. So let me preface by showing a macromolecular picture of a polymer where the most common commodity polymers are essentially linear polymers like polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. On the other hand, what we would call rubber or even epoxies such as thermosets will be considered as cross-linked, lightly cross-linked, and highly cross-linked materials. And through the development of synthetic chemistry, the control of branching, grafting, hyperbranching, and uh, production of uh, uh, dendrimeric systems means control on the flow process properties as well as the eventual thermomechanical applications. And I can go on and on and on and summarize the various types of polymers out there, but probably this slide is quite daunting in terms of the commonly encountered classes, uh, both in industry and even in research. And uh, here I've, I've shown this uh, plot in many times in terms of uh, the pyramid of uh, or hierarchy of polymer performance where the commodity polymers like polyethylene and polystyrene that I mentioned uh, form the base of the pyramid. And most of the polymers you're familiar with 3D printing, including PLA, ABS, uh, uh, these are considered commodity polymers. Yet there is high interest in high performance polymers like PEAK, like ULTEM, like PPSU, PPS, and so on. So what you can see here is that uh, there's a high demand for understanding the properties and failures of this polymer. Uh, also to mention, uh, there is high interest on composites or being able to prepare uh, carbon fiber composites where the building block is essentially a hybrid of a polymer material and let's say a carbon fiber or Kevlar or glass fiber that reinforces the thermomechanical properties of a material on a light weighting or strength to weight ratio basis. So my question really is, why do we need to study the thermical properties and characteristics of 3D printed polymers and composites? Well, we need to understand how we can take a prototyping or essentially prototyping system into an actual parts replacement and production. And needless to say, when you actually use parts, they fail. So a big question in our mind is, can we use a 3D printed part to replace, quote unquote, the real part, okay? Second, we want to understand the relationship between the printing method and the direction or build orientation. And that is almost commonsensical but it's more complex than that. The uh, additive manufacturing method is inherently anisotropic because you are building or stacking layers on top of each other. Therefore, the strength uh, is quite different between the orthogonal and the parallel to the stacking of those polymer materials. Third is we want to improve the types of machines that we will develop, including better, uh, uh, and a software, G-code, uh, design of the um, head, the extruder, etc., in order to get better prints. We want to understand the structure, composition, property relationship of materials that are printed in this manner, 
and improving it versus what is well known in other types of application methods, including a formative methods like injection molding, ultrusion, extrusion, and so on, et cetera. Of course, uh, once we do this, we can get more material companies uh, uh, and researchers involved, not only the 3D printing companies. We will understand the failure modes of materials depending on the production as well as knowledge on the materials and anisotropy. We will understand the unique mechanisms of uh, a, a failure and loading on a 3D printed material. So that means we can have a modified definition of, let's say, tensile, compression, flexural, uh, all those different terms that we are uh, based on monolithic uh, materials and compare them to anisotropic or directionally fabricated materials. And uh, of course, we are interested in unique properties such as shape memory function, uh, uh, biomedical applications, and different environmental uh, failures. So we are interested in helping develop standards for the industry and follow the properties. Now, I'm, I'm not going to talk about an overview of the different standardization uh, uh, tests, the different organizations that are involved. Probably you are familiar with uh, um, ASTM, uh, ISO, um, uh, companies like SGS uh, that can do the testing or Intertech. Uh, probably uh, you are not so familiar with regulation coming from FDA. Uh, for example, NIST is by, by um, um, conception a standard um, developing uh, government aid, yet their other um, um, direction or mission is testing. So not only are standards um, uh, important, they can actually be uh, something that can be used to further product development. However, uh, standards can be misleading. In other words, many people uh, attribute the use of standards towards product development, whereas the case is that before you can actually test a material based on standards, you actually need to optimize the material properties, and that's called product development, okay? So just some examples here, you know, ASTM has many standards on the thermomechanical testing, as well as the chemical testing of properties. And I will not mention specific ASTM standards that relate to tensile, lectural, modulus, etc. NIST, for example, is very interested, even uh, 2015, uh, to develop unique standards for additive manufacturing of materials. And I believe many committees are forming within uh, different organizations uh, like NACE even, or uh, uh, ISO to form unique standards that relate very specifically to 3D printing. The challenge as uh, outlined in this view graph is that you have a variety of materials and equipment. Uh, a number of them are still proprietary that wants to, of course, dominate the market. The simple answer is that uh, in a 3D printing uh, ecosystem, I don't believe, and this is personally, that one size fits all in terms of looking at 3D printing uh, as related to some very specific material uh, 3D printing methods today. And many years from now, we might even be looking at a different 3D printing method. But one has to have a starting place with regards to standardize, uh, standardization of material properties, process, modeling, uh, developing in situ or what we call um, uh, uh, methods, uh, um, in operanda methods, and, and then relating their performance. There's a lot of roadmaps out there. And again, in particular, NIST has tried to develop a roadmap to bring the parties together towards this realization. So in this NIST proposed general structure for manufacturing, uh, one has to start populating the basics such as agreement on terminology, uh, data format, or uh, different types of file formats, 
or being able to understand the uh, supply chain and the raw materials uh, involved. So one can bucketize or put this into categories such as classification of raw materials, a classification of the process equipment, and classification of the finished parts. Now, finishing is often a neglected uh, uh, value chain in additive manufacturing simply because uh, we sometimes uh, neglect that eventually you have a customer who's very interested in a finished part. And it turns out that uh, coating, finishing, polishing, things like that, although small, right now will only grow over time simply because 3D printing itself may not necessarily lend towards a finishing part or segment on manufacturing. So here you can see how this roadmap uh, generates a lot of questions that need answered. So a very uh, simple part of this picture I, is, is a question mark on the filament. What are the filaments available in the market today? Well, I can tell I work with a number of companies in, interested in using additives or developing their own filaments. The filaments you buy, whether it's $30 or $150, is not a monolithic material. What I mean by that is even by making the filament, they actually use a lot of additives and plasticizers. So the properties that you get during printing is not only uh, needs to be optimized to make the filament, but eventually the printed part itself. So therefore, this question perhaps can be answered by first of all, knowing and standardizing uh, the formulation of different filament materials, and then developing methods to characterize the fabrication and use that as a feedback loop to further improve the quality of the filaments and eventually, and hopefully it will translate to the right performance, okay? So one property that you have already encountered if you're a seasoned 3D printer, is the directionality of the printing. So as a layering method, for example, with FDM, you raster the nozzle head to a certain direction that can be also divided into angles from zero to 90 degrees or flat to orthogonal in terms of the orientation towards the elevating platform. What that means is that during printing, you have basically lines that are deposited. Uh, unlike a monolith injected molded material where you inject a bulk material that takes the shape of the mold, the object and design you get are basically based on lines or deposited materials. And one of the first things that need to happen is to remove that residual stress uh, during printing and after 3D printing because if you don't, you are basically trapping kinetically the uh, type of quench, crystallized, and amorphous materials that were first 3D printed. And moreover, you generate what we call air gaps. Now, the air gaps is a function of uh, the, the slicing and the G-code development, how further you refine them, but also the design of the uh, uh, machine, but also you can attribute it to the uh, crystallization properties or quenching properties of the polymers. So for example, um, high melting point polymers such as PEAK are readily quenched when you bring them to room temperature. And notoriously, they can produce also these gaps but are very hard to heal. On the other hand, low TG or glass transition polymer materials can be healed even at low temperatures using annealing methods. So here we can start talking about strength, toughness, uh, impact properties, fracturing properties, elongation at break. This, some of these are quite familiar for people who do a lot of mechanical testing of plastics over the year. So just to uh, start this discussion going, uh, let's talk about ASTM methods. Again, I will not try to give specific numbers or or methods out there. Uh, what, uh, some people have them memorized and I don't. Okay, I admit it, but things like tensile, compression, flexural, impact, hardness, creep uh, tests. There are eight STM and ISO standards and uh, TUV and uh, 
e EU European norm um, methods, which have correspondence that allow us to measure these properties. In fact, if you are an undergraduate student or a graduate student, these are some things you learn or terms you learn in your uh, course uh, before you at actually attribute them as uh, standards. So what we are essentially doing, or another term, is to characterize the compressibility, the bending properties, the peeling, the cyclic clothing, etc. So there are some common sensical terms that we can attribute to some of those tests. Now, uh, one can easily um, uh, distinguish these properties simply by taking note of the orientation. As I mentioned, 3D printing allows you to control the layering of the lines, uh, and you can create a coordinate system where you define the X, Y, and Z. And as you can see here, this is a common uh, designation, the Z axis being perpendicular to the build plate. And one can define the angle by which you can assign that direction during printing. So the question is, after you have printed them, do you test them with correspondence to the direction, whether it's zero to 90 degrees on the tension that you apply on a tensile bar? The answer is yes. You have to specify the direction of printing on the uh, part uh, uh, or standard size uh, dog bone, uh, let's say, that you printed. So here is a picture of a typical tensile test, um, commonly known as ASTM D638. You first prepare a, a uh, tensile bar. It can be molded, but in this case, we 3D print it and then you pull them apart. So by pulling them apart, you are able to measure the stress relationship, giving you the modulus, which is the slope of that material, uh, uh, that graph and uh, a modulus of that material. So the question here is, if I'm going to 3D print this tensile bar, do I 3D print it parallel to the long axis of the bar, perpendicular to the long axis of the bar, 45 degrees to the long axis bar? The answer is any of the above will do, as long as you specify the angle by which you are testing and pulling them apart. So in a typical stress strain behavior, you have here the distinction between a brittle plastic or sometimes a thermoset, a typical plastic or thermoplastic such as curve B, and a typical elastic or elastomeric polymer as such as curve C, okay? And the stress strain behavior uh, of this typical graph can further be distinguished into terms like soft and weak or hard and brittle or hard and strong. Essentially, you do that by characterizing the modulus, the yield strength, the elongation at break, uh, this you can measure, for example, by the area under the curve and characterize them as low, high, or moderate. So this type of distinction is more for um, empirical terminology that's easier to understand without being too quantitative. So what happens is when you pull apart this dog bone, you basically uh, go from uh, um, yeah, an initially isotropic property and uh, becoming anisotropic as you pull them in the opposite direction, resulting in uh, uh, the start of thinning. So that yield is called necking. And as you further, further pull them apart, you essentially propagate the neck length. And then finally, the yield point or the elongation at break, the uh, tensile bar uh, breaks. So this simple stress strain relationship allows you to look at the deformation and the degree to which it goes anywhere from uh, several percent to a thousand percent or more, and therefore be able to characterize the material either as a typical thermoplastic or even a thermoplastic elastomer. Now, here are some data or values uh, of monolithic materials such as polyethylene or uh, polytetrafluoroethylene or nylon. Uh, the tensile modulus, tensile strength numbers, yield strength. So what makes up for the values here? 
Well, given that the uh, uh, dimensions are standardized and the pull rate are standardized, we're really talking here about the degree of crystallinity or uh, a more push to crystalline content of each material. So suffice it to say, uh, the higher the molecular weight, the stronger the intermolecular forces of attraction like hydrogen bonding, the, the more aromatic uh, compositions you have in a polymer, the higher the values will be, okay? And this has something to do with structure, composition, property, relationship, know-how. I simply know and appreciate the molecular property way to their thermomechanical properties so I can do a sort of scaling prediction. What is essentially happening, let's say, is if you're pulling apart a thermoplastic, you are changing the semi-crystalline properties all the way to a different orientation of the crystalline regions uh, anisotropically towards the pull direction and at the same time you are changing the balance between the amorphous and the semi-crystalline com uh, components. So I'm talking here about the uh, curve and the figures that are colored um, violet or pusha, whatever. However, if we're dealing with a brittle material, a, a high uh, melting point thermoplastic, but essentially the realm of thermosets, these materials are highly cross-linked, highly aromatic, uh, they have high melting point, uh, you have very, very high modulus. And therefore, uh, the, the brittle failure only counts when you actually uh, destroy the material, not by extending it uh, through the tension or uh, tensile strength or necking, but rather uh, they simply break bonds, okay? So this is a typical uh, picture. I think this is, uh, let's just give it a color, um, emerald green or whatever. Uh, and and uh, that results in that high modulus number. Now, what about rubber? Well, rubbery materials are also cross-linked, except that they are lightly cross-linked. Uh, furthermore, an elastomer can actually be a thermoplastic or so-called thermoplastic elastomer, which are made up of domains of hard and soft segments, let's say polyurethane, that uh, has shows this uh, low tensile values or or um, very high elongation uh, uh, because simply because the polymers are able to stretch and and does not break up. So deformation uh, becomes irreversible. Uh, deformation is reversible at a certain pain point, but of course, when you stretch it too far, it starts to crystallize. So this is, again, a general picture of what we would expect with most polymers. Uh, here you can see an actual uh, a polymer that uh, uh, has a ductile property such as polypropylene and a more brittle polymer with a higher TG such as polystyrene. And you can see that the ductile polymer um, uh, can elongate much further, but the brittle polymer will simply snap or break. Okay. Uh, the ductile versus brittle polymer characterization uh, can be distinguished here. Furthermore, between polypropylene, PLA, PS, and HDPE. So you can see the tensile stress strain behavior is quite different for these common plastics and that one can rely on their strength uh, or, or uh, aging properties with regards to a specific application. Uh, now, there is such a thing that you should uh, have observed by now, and we all are also very familiar with. That is the time-temperature correspondence of a stress-strain characteristics. So to make a long story short, uh, most polymers by heating, by increasing the temperature of the environment, actually becomes more elastic or, or displays a larger plasticity. Uh, as compared to a low temperature environment. So such is a common knowledge, but also very quantifiable using tensile uh, measurement properties, okay? Um, and here you can see the stress strain curve based on testing with two different temperatures. So the lesson here is when you report your testing protocol, you need to specify the temperature, okay? 
Uh, let's go on to uh, a three-point bending or structural strength. So the ability to bend a material does not mean it's elastomeric, but simply a deformation that is allowed without breaking or snapping the material. And eventually it has uh, an importance in terms of uh, ultimate strength of the material. So in an ASTM D790 standard, essentially a three-point bending test with the dimensions and distance specified, one can, of course, get the flexural strength uh, or modulus of a material. So as shown here is how this testing is made, the application of the load, the specimen, the calculation of that modulus, uh, uh, and, and therefore one can quantify this flexural strength in me uh, me megapascals. The third uh, testing we are referring to is the compression test. So this is, let's say, defined by ASTM D695. Basically, we have a compressible or even incompressible material, and the opposite of tensile, you apply the load to compress the material, to apply it on headlong direction. What you get is the modulus of uh, uh, value uh, of the compressive strength, and along with the tensile yield, deformation, yield point, and elasticity, they basically make up for the basic characteristics of uh, tested material. Uh, you can add to this the hardness test. We typically essentially use a diamond or an indentor and then measure the penetration of that indentation in, in a plastic or a rubber. We sometimes uh, have different types of tests with regards to hardness, but one thing uh, is sure, the hardness gives us the ability to assess the impact strength of a material or the ability to accommodate stress such as dropping or is an inexpensive or even non-destructive way to determine those properties. So there's a Vickers hardness test. There's a Shore hardness test as well. The Vickers hardness test is essentially an indenter that measures the hardness as a function of con a test force divided by mean indent diagonal square. And then this constant is a function of the uh, design of the geometry and, and one can go to more literature or specific procedure with ASTM E384. The short hardness test probably is more common because the durometer is quite inexpensive. It is used to test materials such as rubber or plastic. The hardness value can be determined into uh, two categories, the short A and short B, which basically Classify, classifies two levels of hardness. Uh, one can cite ASTM D2240 to um, relate to the numbers and the interpretation of your short hardness test. Uh, another test which is not as often used for most plastics but uh, can be useful for coatings as well is the NUC hardness test. Basically the design of the indenter uh, is uh, specified in terms of geometry and then you look at the uh, longest diagonal of the diamond shape indent as it penetrates the surface and produces that indenting and then finally we have a rockwell hardness test another test that's actually quite uh, common with the coatings industry you basically have a indenter a spherical indenter that is uh, dropped on the material as well uh, the hardness test uh, can be summarized here. Uh, Rockwell, Vickers, uh, uh, shore hardness, and uh, uh, I'll introduce another test called the Sharpie test. And it can be applied to plastics, all of them in general. The Noob test is better for coatings and then for hard rubber, rubber as well. So here you go, the characterization with, with the indenter using a durometer. You can uh, um, quote a number based on what we call shore A or shore D. Uh, some of the values here are shown pictorially in terms of the numbers. In general, the higher numbers refer to the uh, hard, ha increasing hardening of the material. The low numbers for the shore means you have a more uh, elastomeric or um, yeah, mat material that can accommodate that indentation or load. Uh, here's another uh, picture 
that distinguishes the shore A and shore D values. Uh, there's overlap actually with the Rockwell uh, hardness terms. And most plastics can be classified more effectively with the shore D durometer numbers. However, rubbers, elastomers uh, can more or less fall within the shore A durometer hardness values. Okay. And then uh, the Sharpie impact test allows you to look at the um, uh, ability of the material to absorb shock or, in general, absorb uh, a, an, an indented um, uh, notch where the impact hits that indented notch and thereby giving us a picture of the impact strength of the material. Okay. Uh, and this can be uh, uh, quantified in terms of the uh, sample dimension. So for more, more details, you can look at the ASTM D6110 standard. Uh, here is a IZOD impact test geometry. Basically, you have your material, your test piece, and then the pendulum uh, applies the force that goes directly to the uh, strip notch, and then you measure the uh, ability of this uh, material to absorb that impact or, or um, stress, and then you can code the impact strength as uh, the energy loss per unit thickness, okay? Um, so again, tensile, comprehensive, and flexural creep and creep rupture of plastics in general can be classified into one ASTM number. The, the D2990 is actually used by us very commonly to uh, include all this type of tests in one lamp uh, procedure. And therefore, you can comprehensively uh, test these properties within a batch of, let's say, a 3D printed material. So uh, early on, I can tell you that if you're interested in testing 3D printed materials, you need to, as much as possible, print them on the same batch. Okay. The reason is that during the um, um, equilibration or if you apply annealing or you change the temperature or even the formulation varies. If you don't preach them on the same batch, you can have a very high standard deviation. So if at all possible, when you try to uh, 3D print a uh, sample test for tensile compre compressive and flexural creep uh, testing, try to put all of the design in one batch of printing, okay? Um, Tensile creep test is basically looking at the aging properties of the materials as you change the temperature. So based on that time temperature dependence relationship, I, I did show you that uh, higher temperatures tend to increase the elongation at break uh, of the material and therefore you would expect more plasticization or rubbery behavior, okay? So I guess we can go now to the last part of the talk, which is application. So uh, I, I've talked about uh, the various uh, methods of testing introduction. Big question now, what about 3D printed parts? So here we are, 3D printed parts. Okay, so an overview of 3D printing materials, and this is just a compilation uh, from a publication back in 2017, where a number of tests uh, using different machines and uh, different materials were compiled uh, in a tabulated form. So you can have a picture of how various polymers, different 3D printing methods, different polymers will have different properties. So the one column, the density is specified, more or less uh, about one, the tensile strength. As you can see here, the highest value is achieved through a polymer called polyether ketone, PEAK. It's a high performance, high melting point polymer. In this case, the sample was obtained by SLS uh, using the EOS machine. Tensile modulus, elongation at failure, uh, although the PEAK uh, doesn't have a good elongation at failure, and that's expe expected. Materials like nylon, uh, materials like um, um, composites of uh, uh, elastomeric material will have the elongation at failure to give the highest percentage. And that's expected because they will have a longer elongation at break. And then a term called the heat deflection temperature or HDT. The value uh, means that 
the higher the number, the higher the temperature by which it takes to deform the material. So again, polyether ether ketone, which not only has a high glass transition temperature and a high melting point, does very well. A material like PPSU or polyphenylene uh, sulfone, another high performance material also does very well. On the other hand, uh, uh, commodity plastics like polypropylene, uh, polycarbonate have low values because uh, they can easily deform, their melting point is lower, and they uh, can have uh, a variety of weaknesses in terms of the their heat, uh, intrinsic heat uh, uh, capacity properties, okay? So more examples. Um, uh, in a stress-strain relationship, you have an isotropic material and an anisotropic material of ABS. The 3D printed ABS is anisotropic, whereas the molded ABS is the isotropic material. So you can see here that the anisotropic material uh, is weaker okay, than the isotropic injection molded ABS part. Uh, again, one can ask what direction we're talking about. Actually, this direction was made to show a particular weakness. So this was perpendicular to the build direction. So during the uh, pull out of the material, they basically have a low uh, modulus value. Now uh, here, you can have a tensile bar that's printed in various orientations. Uh, largely perpendicular, orthogonal, lying flat, or in terms of rastering differently. One can then measure the tensile uh, modulus behavior, a stress strain curve as shown here. Uh, it's possible to distinguish uh, one direction does better over the other, but in general, most of this deviation has to be defined by a window. That window of deformation uh, will let you know whether the direction of the material printing really matters. Uh, in another point, the, uh, this type of tests are used to study the use of additives or annealing studies or different types of post-treatment additives, uh, a treatment to determine what is the best way to improve the properties by the use of additives and different uh, annealing treatments. So here in this case of a post-curing temperature on a photopolymerized uh, material, the, uh, the SLA 3D printed part um, based on the UV exposure at a variety of temperatures shows that the UV exp exposure at 400 nanometers and a higher temperature of 60 degrees C actually gave the more superior properties. And we have published some papers. We know that this is attributed to a better curing or complete curing with a higher temperature, as well as rearrangement of the bonds that goes on with this particular thermoset. Here is another picture of an SLA 3D printed part, but uh, cured at a constant temperature with different uh, uh, wavelengths, okay? So here I can tell you that the wavelength is closer to the photo initiation uh, system that was used to uh, polymerize this material or make it into our thermoset. Therefore, the effect here is more of latent curing or trying to complete the curing process with unreacted uh, um, acrylate groups that can then be um, uh, polymerized with this latent curing. And then here uh, is a picture of uh, the testing uh, where the photo curing of an epoxy resin made by SLA and the curing at a longer temperature. So the gist here is that even at 4R curing, you observe maximum strength of the material. So that means you need not cure it all the way to 8 hours to achieve a maximum strength uh, or post curing condition. Okay. Uh, here is some pictorial representation. This in this case, these are SLS 3D printed parts just to highlight pictorially how the orientation results in fracturing uh, geometry, okay? Uh, here is an infrared camera showing the stages by which fracturing occurs and the uh, instant uh, necking as well as the yield resulting in a higher temperature zone 
where the fracturing actually occurred. And actually, this is a picture of the stress level that was applied to cross fracturing. Okay, so we're almost done. I'm just highlighting the various ways you can vary the design and know the proper material. One thing is you can change the infill volume or design. Uh, and therefore, the infill design or volume as well changes the tensile properties of the material. So I've, I've given you, I believe, an, a good overview of uh, properties of polymer materials. Basics on testing methods, some examples of how we have looked at various 3D printing and post 3D printing treatment to improve materials. Uh, there are more things to talk about, additives and other uh, design geometries to improve the 3D printing, but my time is up. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you may pose uh, to Richard and, and enlighten you more with regards to this topic. Okay, thank you, Dr. Advencula. If anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type them in the questions module or click the raise your hand icon. Uh, we do have one question that came in early on that I will post to you to get us started. Um, how do you recommend to image topography of printed gels? Okay, so um, uh, the, the question here is uh, the topography of the gel itself before or after some of this testing. Well, in terms of the topography morphology, we typically go from optical microscopy to uh, SEM, uh, scanning electron microscopy, all the way to uh, TEM, transmission electron microscopy. And I say that with increasing levels, one is the, the uh, material itself can have difficulties in terms of mounting as a sample, uh, if it's transparent uh, in an optical microscope. However, I believe the SEM, if you can sufficiently use cryogenic methods to um, fix the morphology of the gel, as well as uh, uh, provide some spattering methods is a very useful technique. However, uh, the gel is a, is, is a difficult material to begin with. So for example, we have looked at uh, atomic force microscopy methods just to look at the topology of the surface. And maybe one can apply some uh, nano indentation methods to even test them. Great, thank you. Sorry, I'm just answering a question here. Um, if anybody else has a question, please submit it now. Just give you another moment or two. All right, well, I don't see anything else coming in, so I'll take this opportunity to ask my uh, usual one final question which is, can you give us a brief preview of next month's webinar topic, which is pipe protective coatings? Yes, so uh, this is a deviation, of course, from the uh, series we've had uh, the last uh, few months on 3D printing materials. But nevertheless, the topic is dear to my heart because I want to protect things and I uh, look at corrosion issues. So protected coatings, uh, they can be divided into, uh, again, uh, different classes of thermoset uh, based dispersion based materials uh, uh, bordering on what we call adhesives as well as powder coatings etc um, I will give an overview of the various classes of protective coatings number one is to protect against corrosion uh, chemical attack environmental uh, issues as well but in general in the in this uh, topic or even tutorial, you will learn a lot about what are the various ways or, or, or methods of, and materials for coatings that are used for protecting surfaces and assets. All right, thank you very much. And thank everyone for joining us for this session. Uh, you can find more information about Park Systems AFM at parksystems.com. And please feel free to direct any AFM questions you have to inquiry at parksystems.com. If you have any questions specific to this webinar series, feel free to reach out to me directly at richard at parksystems.com. To stay up to date on all of our upcoming webinars, online live demos and workshops, please go to parksystems.com slash online nano academy. Thanks again for joining us today and stay safe, everybody. Thank you.